So we are here for our fifth installment of this um, artist talk with uh, used, utilizing video conferencing. And we are with Amanda Chestnut. Um, I'm Mike Rippey. I uh, run Yield Magazine and I work at the Snipe Museum of Art at the University of Notre Dame. And so we're going to talk to Amanda about her work. And she, before we get started, she's going to let us know uh, about who she is, how she got started with photography, and then we'll just jump right into her work. All right. Um, hey, I'm Amanda Chestnut. Um, I have been making photographs, I think I photo class when I was maybe 11 or 12. So I, I get to brag and say I've been doing photography for about 25 years and then people are like, oh my, and um, it's, it's, it's fun. Yeah, um, so I do photography, I do photo books. Um, I've literally been making books for my entire life. I used to, I remember I used to, before I could write, take a blank sketch pad and draw out the, an entire story and then take it to my mother and make her write the story down that went along with the pictures I had drawn. So I've been making books literally for my whole life, um, photographs for about 25 years. Um, so I wound up um, in graduate school uh, I went to school at Visual Studies Workshop in Rochester, New York to get an MFA, and I had intended to go into arts management. I'd wanted to do that since high school, because when I was like 17 or 18, I decided I wanted to go into nonprofit arts management, because that's what you do when you're a teenager. Um, and then I uh, was having trouble finding work without a master's degree, so I saw that um, VSW is... Uh, accredited through Brockport, which is part of the State University of New York school system. So it cost much, much less than most other MFAs. So I was like, great, I can get in on photo and I'll get that magical piece of paper and I'll get my job. And I got in and I realized that photo was definitely a lot more than what I had been doing with it so far to that point. So um, a lot of the work, actually, I think all the work that you're going to see I've done since I started at Visual Studies Workshop, that was in 2014. I think I started in 2014. Um, so I'm still relatively new to this whole being an artist part of being a photographer, even though I've been a photographer for a very long time. I've been making images, taking classes, studying photography, learning about photography, the history of photography. Um, so being an artist is still relatively new to me, kind of navigating that fun new world. <laughs> So let's go ahead and jump in and, and start looking at your work. Um, so let me share my screen. Yeah. If anyone's curious, I'm drinking a Long Trail <laughs> uh, double bag, Long Trail Brewing Company from Vermont. It's delicious. Um, so this first slide here is from Visual Studies Workshop. If you ever have a chance to take any of their classes, um, especially their summer courses, I highly recommend it. It is worth every penny. Um, it's intensive, but it's great. Uh, I had gone, the class I was taking was with um, Andrea Saltanez, and um, we were given the assignment to make a book from the archives at VSW, and VSW's archives are extensive. There's millions of images in all kinds of different archives. So the one on the left side of your screen is the lantern slide part of the archive, and I um, had been challenged by some of my mentors to really work on making a more personal project. I'd been doing a lot of building photography that was very painterly and very softly lit with these really interesting textures, and everybody's like, okay, so where are you? Um, so I went into the archives looking for myself and I started thinking about my father's family who I know much less about than my mother's family. Um, he's from the South. So I started in the lantern slides. I'm not sure if you can see it on your screen, but that, um, little piece of paper sticking up from that lantern mm -hmm. slides is cotton. So I looked through the slides at images of the South and images of farmers and images of cotton and I wasn't really finding anything. So on the right, I go to the Soilman 
archive, the Soibelman Syndicate News Agency archive. Um, that's a bunch of photographs from the interwar period. So between World War One and World War Two, it worked kind of like how the AP works, except back then it wasn't just like just the AP. There were dozens of these different news archives and you could be like, yeah, I need a photograph of the Mississippi Corn Queen of 1934. And you could just like call up these archives and get this image. And this is one of those archives. So um, it, sometime in the 90s, someone had decided that the archive needed to be rearranged by photographer instead of by topic. And you can't really do that in a press archive because how are you going to find Miss Corn Queen of Mississippi if it's not sorted by corn or queen or Mississippi, but instead by photographer. Mm -hmm. So um, they got about halfway through and they were like, oh shit, we have to put this back. <laughs> so um, the folder that you see on the right is titled Dance. And that woman um, who is very scantily clad is performing a dance called the dance of the slave God. And on the left, there's a folder called African American civil rights, Jesse Owens. And that woman on top is Mae Johnson in new bonding club in New York, um, performing a striptease. So I open up these two folders back to back and find this huge contrast of images and Sure, that woman performing the dance of the slave god might have been in a folder titled dance, but there's no way that in between World War I and World War II, someone would have titled a photo, a folder folder, African American Civil Rights Jesse Owens. So that's a totally modern construct that's been applied to these images. And as I'm going through them, I wind up coming up with a couple different projects. So um, one of them is CP and Stars. That's the next slide. Um, you can see um, on the next one, you can see there's May on the left and Jesse Owens on the right. Um, the photographic project was kind of, I feel like relative to a lot of my work, a little rudimentary. Um, it was like new, it was kind of basic, um, but it was really important for me to start thinking about placing images in books, pairing images with text, thinking about the archive, thinking about representation. So all of that wound up kind of feeding into what the next project was, which was really a dis dissection of that folder, African American Civil Rights Jesse Owens. So I took those individual photos and then broke them down, you'll see in the next slide, and kind of dissected them. So we see the original photograph from the archive and then I wanted to kind of look at the language that was present there because I really do feel like archives are a representation of both the time that they were created in and um, the, the people that were in those images but also the, the ideas that were popular and present at that point in time like that, that's how those images wound up being important enough to store for decades in the first place. So um, I paired in, for example, in this book, I pair, I had taken that image of the young man in the chair and just cropped it down to that cigar in his crotch. And he's um, one of the um, boys from Mississippi who had been falsely accused of raping a white woman and um, Langston Hughes had spent a lot of time visiting them in prison while they were incarcerated. There's a bunch of photographs of them being released in the Sullivan archive. But um, I, I took this photo specifically and then I paired it with the Hughes poem that's on the next slide. Um, it's, um, oh gosh, what is it? Cry, Christ to the South, I think is what it's called. That text is too tiny for me to read. Yeah, I can't zoom in on it either. Wait, set up. <laughs> I'm going to look it up right quick. Christ in Alabama. So they're the Scottsboro boys. Um, 
he published it. Um, he had written this poem while he was visiting them. So it's the archive be, for me was a really interesting look at um, the past, but you look at what happened to the Scottsboro boys and then you look at a contemporary story like the Central Park Five, who our current president spent a lot of time and money trying to convince people of their guilt. Um, who were, again, black men accused of assaulting a white woman. So this, this poem reads, Christ is a nigger beaten in black, oh, bear your back. Marry his mother, mammy of the South, silence your mouth. God is his father, white master above, grant him your love. Most holy bastard of the bleeding mouth, nigger Christ on the cross of the South. Like, that's hard. <laughs> like, and, and I see so many parallels between what I was finding in the archive and contemporary stories. And everybody I showed these books to were like, look at these cute photos of the past. And I'm like, no, 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 they're photos of the present. These are now. And um, they were like, no, no, look, at it's, it's a yellowed picture. I can tell, look at his old timey clothes. This is old. And I'm like, no, this is now, this is now. So what I wound up doing, if you go to the next slide, is um, incorporating poems that, were personal experiences either of myself or my family members. So I had um, taken photographs um, after, I, if you remember from when we had the dual screen up before, I, I wear my hair in a mohawk. I saved all the hair that I cut off and made it into a couple different projects. And one of them was photographing the hair. And I took those images of the hair and put them on the fronts of these books. And um, I, wanted to let people know how these historic stories are still present and how they're repeated for in contemporary lives. Um, so for example, um, let's see if I can pull one up right quick so I can read it to you. I think the idea of bringing in your photography, the, the, the photographs of the hair, kind of kind of force it to be contemporary, you know what I mean? It forces it to be current and not just stay like this, like an archive, like a book of, ar of archive photographs, because you're kind, of, you, you know, you're kind of mixing it in there. And then with the poems on top of it, you know, it, it kind of, it, it creates this kind of timeline. Um, yes. <laughs> and and um, I think for a lot of people, they they I, I think that it, it's it's interesting to me to see different groups of people interact with this work. Um, I've seen people walk in to the room, um, pick up one or two books, and actually. Uh, Never mind. it's like a whole bunch of slides up. Oh, let me, I'm right here. I'll just change the order. All right, so can you go to the next slide? Oh, can you go back? Whoa, no. Yeah, go forward two. One, two. Nah, it's not in order. It didn't change. <laughs> let me refresh this and see if it does anything. So I have it on as slide eight on my screen. This one? Sweet. Okay. <laughs> so I set, I always, I, I always have been displaying these so far with them all spread out across the room. And I've definitely had people walk into the room, pick up one or two books and set them down and walk away. And they like, give me the stink eye. And I'm like, I'm sorry. And they're like, I, I don't need to read this. I already know this story. Why would you make me read this? And I'm like, ah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, other people really do kind of take the time and read every one and it's interesting when you're in a room full of people reading them because they never wind up in the same spot so it really then does start to kind of mimic how memory works um, combining the historic with the contemporary and and having it become very fluid and having the stories kind of bump up against each other and shuffle around and not really stay in order um, it's really exciting to actually watch this work 
in action. I love that it's touchable. I love mm -hmm. that it's almost kinetic in that sense. Um, so yeah, that's a lot about this work. Well, I think also it has this kind of, and you can correct me if I'm wrong because I might be way off base here, but like this kind of connection with like historical fiction, like in writing, you know, like you're creating this story, but you're going, you're taking things from the past, the historical things from the past and putting them in this new story that you're creating. And I think it's interesting to kind of, to, to find something in literature that kind of has the same kind of connection to where you're, you know, you're, you're, you're using history to tell a new story. Yes. Yeah. And it's not like, it's not historical fiction in the same sense that um, like Watermelon Woman is, hmm. um, where it's an entirely created archival representation of a fictitious person based very strongly on social norms of the time. It, it's um, fictitious in that it's, it's forcing this connection Mm -hmm. Really, just in my imagination, yeah, uh, forcing it for other people mm -hmm. as well. So yeah, no, I do agree with that. Um, so next slide, yeah. Uh, so uh, why do you have to make everything about race? Um, this was painted black on black on about an 11 foot by 11 foot wall. I've since remade it on um, black cotton fabric. Anytime I use fabric of any kind in any of my exhibits, I use 100% cotton um, because my family, my immediate family mostly picked tobacco actually, but in theory, my family would have been picking cotton. Um, so, um, after that whole series of books, I was getting asked often, why do you have to make everything about race? Um, and, and for me, what I wanted to do was turn that question around and ask it back because I felt like everyone else was doing that. And I was just pointing out the obvious. Mm -hmm. So, um, the, it, it serves as a really big really, really big, I mean, it's 11 feet tall, really big way of kind of opening up that, yes, this is going to be art about race. This mm -hmm. is going to be art about the color of my skin and how that has impacted me. Um, I, in school, um, again, partially inspired by Langston Hughes, made a really deliberate choice to make work as an artist of color. Um, I think that it's a privilege for me to be able to make art. Um, it is an even bigger privilege for me to be able to talk about my art and to show my art and then to even have people listen to me talk about my art and then to come and look at my art. Like that's a huge privilege. Hmm. So I, I take that as a responsibility and I really feel like if this is the opportunity I have, if this is the voice I have, then I really want to do the best I can to actually say something with it. Um, I don't have enough money to buy a fancy enough camera to take some kind of photograph that's going to be a photograph that nobody's ever taken before. I just don't. I can't make a photograph that doesn't exist. Um, so what I can do is guide people through the images and stories that are already there. Hmm. So that's in part what I'm trying to do with my work. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide, I'm looking at the time. I'm talking a lot. <laughs> no, it's good, good. Interrupt. I think, I think you should talk about as much as you uh, that comes to mind about your work. I mean, I'm just I'm becoming more and more interested in the connections with the bookmaking and, you know, the use of like in this image, the use of your hair and making, you know, contemporary images that also that force you to when you look at uh, images from the past that force you to make those kind of 
contemporary connections? Um, well, as far as forcing people and my hair, if you want to look <laughs> at the next one, um, now you have permission to touch my hair. This is what I did with all of that hair from my mohawk that I cut off. Um, I wrote, I, um, wrote and erased her poem using the sentence, now you have permission to touch my hair. Um, I made it a question, I made it a statement, I made it a demand, and eventually the last page says, now touch my hair, and has an entire sheet of my hair sewn into the back of the book. Um, it's then, uh, my mother is one of the first people who actually looked through the book in its entirety because of course the first time I showed it was at my thesis show and it's like two nights before the show opens and I'm having the other woman who's exhibiting with me cut off extra hair because I don't have quite enough to finish sewing on the last row because it's grad school and that's what you do. Mm, right. Um, I'm like, oh, Barbara will fix it tomorrow. Just cut my hair off. I need to finish this book. Um, the So my mom gets to the last page and she opens it all the way up and then she lays her face down in it and she said, oh, it still smells like you and it's so soft. Oh, wow. And because it was my mother, it was fine. Mm -hmm. But when her boyfriend went to go look at it, he like <laughs> couldn't touch it. He circled around the room like four times until mm. he like came over and closed the book. He couldn't even bring himself to touch mm. my hair because it was way too intense and personal and private for him to even think about doing that. So, um, it's it's also it's really a trip to watch people interact with that book and to watch people watching people interact with that book i had one guy it's an accordion book so you can take it and pull out the poem all the way and it's probably i mean it's longer than the span of one arm so it's probably a good four feet long mm -hmm. when you pull it out i was talking to this young man while the gallery was kind of buzzing and somebody did that and he started like he was gonna go pick a fight with this person. And I said, whoa, what was that? And he said, I don't know, but that was scary. He got very aggressive mm -hmm. and defensive and angry that somebody would touch this book containing my hair in that way. Um, and I don't know if it matters, but he is what is a person of color and the person who was doing it was white. Um, and he felt like it was so, harsh and disrespectful that he had this very visceral reaction to it. Um, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. I could, I could see that easily. You know, it, it's such a strange thing to have. I mean, it's part of your body that's there, you know, it's so bizarre. And I never really thought about it and thought about how your mother reacts to it versus someone else. It's, it's really interesting. I mean, as a parent myself, I could see being much more comfortable being around, you know, if it was my daughter's hair, you right. know, being really comfortable then it but then seeing someone else touch it or interact with it I think I might be like that's ah, kind of you know personal you know if someone picked up a book full of your daughter's hair and stretched it halfway across the room what yeah. might you do? so yeah. Um, so yeah it's um again I really just want to part of me is like it's just hair it'll grow back mm -hmm. um you know, I'm always very willing, if somebody asks me to touch my hair, I'm always very willing to let them. Because um, we're curious animals and just ask permission first and that's fine. I, I can deal with well, that. You probably have amazing hair also. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it, and that's the other thing. Like, I, I, I feel like I can't walk around with this big old hair sticking out in every direction and not have people want to be like, ooh, like, <laughs> all right, I don't blame you because it is kind of cool looking. I'll, I'll, I'll give them that. Like, um, so, you know, ask first, but I know <laughs> that some people are like, you don't even ask. I yeah. was standing in line at the grocery store and some man reached over and touched the cashier's hair and me, the cashier who was ringing me out, and the woman behind me all turned around like we were going to murder him. And she's like, no, it's okay, I know him. And, and all of us were like, okay, that's fine. But like for a hot second, these three black women standing in Wegmans were ready to throw down with his yeah. little wife as he touched this woman's hair. Yeah. Um, yeah, that would be strange. If I saw that, I would think the same thing. Like, what is going on? <laughs> so, you know, if there, are, there are broader social implications that I'm, I'm trying to – you know, I want to I challenge people to, to think about how they nav 
navigate space and how they engage with others in this book. And, and, and part of that is, you know, who, who owns these things, who gets to ask for, who gets to ask for permission, who gets to give permission, who, you know, that's, that's a point of privilege that I can say, yes, it's okay for me to, with me, if you touch my hair, like that is a privilege that I have, that I can grant that kind of permission. So it's all stuff that I'm looking at. So then you started creating these cyanotype books also, or was this something, when did, when did the cyanotype books start happening? I made those in Woodstock uh, at the Center for Photography uh, when I was in residence there. Um, the um, Juan Madrid was working in their print shop. He's um, great. He's brilliant. He's, I mean, he's a great photographer in his own right, but he can work a printer like very few people I have ever met. So uh, he was working out some bugs in the printer, printing a project for me, and there had been some extra cyanotype paper from a weekend project thing that somebody had done. I was like, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll play with it, because I carry my hair with me when I go on trips to make art. Um, I had all this extra hair. So um, I made this series of four books with the cyanotypes. Um, they're just photograms of my hair and then I arranged them. Um, I made them in pairs, so I made two at a time. So each spread is there. there um, each paid, each um, photogram is hinge hung on the book and then the book is um, Coptic stitched together. It's all in this beautiful, um, very toothy watercolor paper. Um, and then I, when I made the case for the book, I cased it in, in again, cotton canvas. And then I had double case, I had a double thick book board. So I cut away a window in the back and added hair in there. But in, in this instance, I put it behind the um, clear acetate. Um, so this one was a little bit more precious. Mm -hmm. um, this hair you can't touch, like you literally have to peel the book apart in order to get the hair to touch it. So you can see the hair, you can see a representation of the hair, but you can't actually get in there and touch the hair without actually destroying the book. Um, so I, I really loved this project. It was kind of a spontaneous thing that came together, but um, the way it wound up working out, I'm, I'm really, really pleased with. Um, so are we so are we coming up on uh, newer work now or is this this is newer work so I um, the um, hair photos I photographed my all my hair when I had it cut off but I've just kind of been navigating what I'm gonna do with those images um, so a lot of them wound up looking like genetic material so this project um, is the, called loosely the ties that bind us. Um, they're a larger format print. Um, what are those like 1620, I think? Um, a really glossy, shiny, almost metallic looking paper. And um, I'm kind of thinking about that, that family tie that a lot of this comes back to family for me. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of it comes back to identity, looking for the self, um, figuring out what makes the self, how much history do I carry with me um, that, that makes up who I am. Um, even, even before I started thinking about it, like how much of that is there and how much of that is, is carried in me. Um, you know, they say that trauma is something that actually changes us on the genetic level and that it can be carried over from generation to generation. So it was really interesting to me, knowing how much trauma my family had experienced in the past, that so many of these images of my hair wound up looking like DNA. So um, I don't know if all of that comes clear immediately just looking at the photographs, but I feel like if you spend enough time with all of my art in general, it kind of starts to bend towards that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think if anyone spends, you know, if you spend 
a little, I think even just a little amount of time, you start to make those connections with, with this. And the fact that the, the hair almost becomes an abstraction also, I think, helps tie in with that idea of the DNA and, you know, just the, the character of the hair generally. I think it just, it really just kind of pushes it towards there. The, oh, my apron. Uh, I am not your intellectual mammy. I've actually redone this work and I was desperately searching. Can you still hear me? Yep, I can see you and hear you. Yep. Um, I was desperately searching for images of the newer piece and couldn't find them. I think they're on my computer at work. Um, but I, um, f for me, I, um, made this apron it's an apron it's um got smocking i taught myself how to smock to make this apron um and then i cross stitched on it which again i was vaguely aware of how to do from when i was a little kid but probably hadn't done it since i was seven or eight years old um cross stitched on it i am not your intellectual mammy and for me it's interesting and it's a phrase that i come back to a lot because part of me really wants to be an intellectual caretaker. I want to encourage people to learn. I want to give them resources. I want to coach them through those resources. I want to ask them questions that hopefully lead them to more um, insightful views of themselves and of those around them. And part of me knows that's not my job. <laughs> like I don't have to do that for anyone. I don't owe anyone that much work. Um, I, um, I'm trying to encourage, right now, I'm trying to encourage some of the local institutions, and I, I live in Rochester, New York, and um, Frederick Douglass lived in Rochester for much of his life until his home was firebombed and he moved to Washington, D.C. Um, he um, is highly venerated throughout the city, but I'm always encouraging people to do more. And in encouraging people to do more, I often make them angry because they already feel like they're doing enough. So I'm trying to very gently coax people into that more because it's so needed so badly, but it's so not my job. <laughs> like, I just want to be like, why isn't there more? And then have everybody look around and be like, oh yeah, there should be more. Let's go do it. Um, <laughs> So it's um, the, the I, I, part of me wants to project that I am not your intellectual mammy and, and have that be my front and have that be who I am. And I am not your caretaker and I am not here to fix your emotions. And I am not here to coddle you and to pat your head and to tell you it'll all be okay. And, um, and part of me is like, yeah, I'm going to have to do this work if we're going to make any change. So right. um, it's, it's, um, it's an interesting line for me to walk. I hope yeah, I, do. I, think, I think a lot of people go through this, this idea that, you know, it's, it's how engaged and how, you know, it, it's, it's interesting because I think there are a lot, lot, there's a large group of people I think out there that, that want to do more and, and do like what you say. They kind of look around and see, okay, who's who's on board with this? And then you realize, oh, that's me. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I don't know going to do this. <laughs> now, in all fairness, there are some really, really fantastic people in Rochester who are putting in the work. Um, so I'm really grateful for uh, those folks like Rena Golden and um, Rachel de Guzman and Ralph Thompson. Um, there is an amazing crew of people who are really, really leading. Um, even where I work at the Flower City Arts Center, you know, we, we're, we're looking at what can we do, what, where are we lacking, who do we need to reach, how are we going to reach them, how are we going to meet them where they are, um, how are we going to make sure we're as accessible as possible. So um, there are definitely people in the city doing that work. I just want more. I always want more. Mm -hmm. um, and I find that working its way into my art often. Uh, 
Uh, Good Hair is another series that I've worked on with those hair images. I made um, letterpress plates, a three color letterpress plate out of each image of my hair. Well, not out of each one, but out of m many images of my hair, I made three color letterpress plates and um, did this series um, in the CMY color scheme. Um, I tried it on a couple different papers, some metallic surfaces. It's interesting to me because I've definitely had them be compared to looking very vaginal, um, depending on how they're displayed and which paper they're on. So um, for me to get, receive that critique, I actually really like that. Um, good hair is more in reference to my hair itself, the hair on my head. Um, I wear my hair natural. I've been wearing my hair natural for years, but for a very long time, it's jokingly called the good hair lie, um, that your hair needs to be straight in order for it to be pretty and in order for you to be valued, especially as a woman, um, in order for you to be seen as uh, kept and as clean and as self-caring and as proactive um, and as smart, you need to have straight hair. Um, all of that is a lie. All of that is bullshit. Um, so when I made these plates and reduced the images of my hair to just those three colors, it really pushed that abstraction very far beyond what was happening in the photographic images of my hair. Um, so then people were like, yeah, that looks like a vagina. And I'm like, all right, it's art. There's vaginas everywhere. Cool. Um, <laughs> So it's, it's um, and I'm really okay with, with even that because like, again, like this is another thing that women have to deal with, that it has to be a certain way in order for it to be socially acceptable, but it needs to be right on that very fine line. Like your hair has to be straight, but don't let yeah. anybody know you have a weave because that's not good. Don't let anybody know you have a wig because that's not good. It has to be a certain way. So it's it, that's really interesting also and i haven't ever thought about this uh about the impact of the way your hair is styled also i have a sister-in-law who has very curly hair and she sometimes straightens it and i think when she straightens it people think oh well she's much more sophisticated now that she has the straight it's it's bizarre it's like things that i i hadn't picked up on but like that's one thing that's obvious to me now that you mentioned this is that just her doing that little change just ch changes how people kind of interact with her, I, I think. Yes. Now, yeah. imagine that's also like how you get a job mm -hmm. or how you get a date right? or how you get a promotion or how you're treated at a, when you get a speeding ticket or how, yeah, it's, it's a long list that is in range from vaguely annoying to can be literally life threatening. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and that good hair thing is still just such a lie but it's sometimes a line that pe women do have to choose you know they, they do have to choose to, to take that lie on in order to make their life work for themselves is this the last slide I gave you this is the last slide I gave yep, you yep this is this last one so the very last one is uh, my current project. Um, I had a mentor pass away um, during my last year of graduate school, Rick Hawk, um, who had worked at the Eastman Museum and then was uh, teaching at Visual Studies Workshop. And he always challenged us to think beyond the photograph. Um, the um, woman who did her show with me had these um, waterfall videos and, or she had these waterfall photos that she kept coming in to class with and he's like well what are these pictures of and she's like it's the light look at the light he's like well why aren't you bringing me the light why are you bringing me photographs where's the light so um he really pushed us to, to dig in as, as much as we possibly could. So um, when he passed away, I really walked from 
the camera. I really did stop taking photographs for a good three or four years. Uh, so with this project, um, I'm kind of going back to the camera for the first time in a long time. Um, I'm working on looking through family archives. So this is, that's myself with my dad. Mm -hmm. um, it's a uh, needle point. I've sewn gold thread over the image. That's my dog, Barkley. Um, we, I'm going back through family archives, looking at photographs from when I was about two or three years old, maybe up till four. Um, and then I am taking a film camera out and photographing my dad, how he is now. Um, he's had a pretty rough go of it. And he's really lucky to be alive at this point. Um, but he's finally really taking care of himself and doing health, being, being more healthy and being more happy. And I'm, again, really interested in how his trauma has been carried by him. So uh, my current project, and I have no idea when I'm like, yeah, I'll show you the photographs and I'm, I'll have a book done. And no, 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 I, I, this is, this is going to be a long time coming mm -hmm. but I'd really like to spend some time photographing him in his home um him in his newest environment I just moved him up to live closer to me now uh a year ago um and could kind of place those images next to each other those images from the early 80s with those images that are current and see who he is and I don't know if you can see that in a photograph um because I don't want to just see like, oh, there's my dad. Um, you know, I want to see there's my dad who had a gun drawn on him when he was driving a school bus and the school's desegregated. Um, I want to see there's my dad who had a noose placed around his neck and was threatened to be pushed off a bridge when he was on a job site uh, when he was working construction. Um, there's my dad who, when his mother had a stroke, he quit his job at Gleason Works here in Rochester and went back down south to take care of her, um, not really knowing if he would ever be able to come back and have a job and be able to support the people that he needed to. Um, and I don't know if you can see all that from a photograph. So oh, wow. I, I'm going to see if I can figure out how. Yeah. Well, you just, you just went through a lot of very visual things, you know, so I, I think that's, I think it's there. I think it's just a matter of how to put, put all that together. So that's yeah. going to be a big task and you should probably take as much time as you need to do it. <laughs> yeah. I'm, and I'm really okay with taking the time. And I feel like other little projects, you know, that cyanotype book I put together in a week when the printer wasn't doing what I wanted it to do. So I know that there'll be other projects that'll come along as, as they need to come along. But um, I think this is something that is really demanding my time and attention right now. So this is, this is what I'm working on at this point in time. Well, that's great, uh, Amanda. I pre appreciate you coming on here and uh, sharing your work with us. We haven't had anybody join the conversation, but at this point it's not uh, unheard of to not have anybody come on the actual live uh, event. Um, but uh, people will comment on Facebook and we will be sharing this on YouTube and on our website. Um, so I just, I just wanted to say, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your work and I really enjoy it. And I appreciate everything that you do to help support our projects. Um, oh, of course. And, uh, if, uh, if any, if you have any other questions or, uh, if you want to have anything else to share, you know, feel free right now. Absolutely. And thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk about my work. I love talking about myself. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> awesome. Um, and I'm hoping that we, we can get you more and more involved with what's going on with Yield. I mean, you've been, like I said, you've been a great supporter and uh, it's, it's, it's good to have people that understand the medium and the, 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 the different approaches you can take with photography to make your work. You know, it's that's, it's not always just straight documentary. I mean, you throw in, you know, four or five, six different things with your work. And it's great that you have this different, you're coming at it from a, from multiple directions. So it's really helpful to kind of get your input on, you know, what's going on as well. Um, 
I think we'll probably just wrap it up then. If you don't have anything else to, you want to comment on. No, but if anybody does have any questions, they can always leave them on Facebook and I'll check that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, Amanda is very, she's on, uh, she's very active on social media and she's pretty easy to get a hold of. Um, and if anybody has any questions on the Yield Magazine or what we're doing in the future, you can go to any of our social media outlets. Um, all the future talks are on uh, our Facebook events page. So I think with, with that, I'll just uh, say thank you again, Amanda, and uh, I'll be talking to you again soon, and that'll, that'll wrap it up. Have a good night. Yeah, you too. Thanks. Thank you.